Um, but I did begin a message last week that I called, Believers shall, shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And I think the essence of the message for me was that, um, and I also shared a story, for those of you who are here for the first time, about Vince Lombardi, known as one of the greatest coaches that ever lived. No, please, thank you. Vince Lombardi, you know, after they lost one of the NFL championships, he opened up their training, their, I guess they said it was summer training in the article, but they opened up their next season of training. <laughs> and so he had his 38, you know, elite athletes present, and he picked up a football and he went, gentlemen, this is a football. And they began at that level running every level of skill. And so he became one of the most famous coaches ever to live. And even Kansas City now is trying to get three in a row. Because Vince Lombardi won three in a row NFL championships in a five in a seven year period of time, and they won five in total during that period of time, and they never lost, had a losing season from that point forward. Every year he would go back to gentlemen, this is a football. And one of his elite athletes, uh, like uh, a pro bowler that was the elite of the elite, said, hey, coach, slow down. You're going too fast for me. And he was just talking about how to tackle, you know, <laughs> how to do the simplest of things. But that review every season caused them to become great champions because they focused on what others did not focus on. They focused on the fundamentals, the skills, and so when I was looking at Mark chapter 16, it seems to me that if the last words of Jesus happened to be, and believers shall lay hands, well, go into all the world and preach this gospel, those that believe shall be saved, those who do not shall be damned, many other pieces to that passage, but believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So it appears to me that this is the skill set if you will, the commission that Jesus left with us. So therefore, as the body of Christ, we want to identify both with the importance and the simplicity of what he's asked us to do. And so in last week's teaching, we talked, I talked quite a bit about uh, when Jesus said to lay hands on the sick, that Greek word, just in review, you don't mind if I review a little bit, do you? because that helps build the foundation for others. But that Greek word for sick is arustos. And arustos is literally a sickness of such a degree that a person is an invalid and cannot take care of themselves. So what Jesus was trying to demonstrate for you and I is that <laughs> I'm sending you not to heal a stuffy nose or, you know, a little cold, but I'm empowering you with the ability to handle the most difficult of all sicknesses and diseases. And so we overlook these because we look at the word sick, but it's a rustos, an invalid, someone who is unable to even pray or take care of themselves. We lay hands on them and they shall, and this is the other important part of that passage, they shall recover. And so... I spent a little bit of time talking about the difference between do you believe in healing or are you believing for your healing? It doesn't sound like much. In the English language, really, it's the difference in a preposition and the addition of your name or you. So it doesn't sound like there's much difference between the two. But you can ask most anyone if they believe in healing well of course God can do whatever he wants to do but the bigger question is are you believing for your healing and what does it mean to have an expectation for your healing now what does that have to do with and they shall recover well simply put Jesus didn't say you'd lay hands on the sick and you'd see him instantly healed he didn't say that. He said, they shall recover. And that same passage also tells us, you know, those who believe shall be saved. Correct? 
and I asked this question last week, if someone doesn't believe, does that make salvation of none effect? In other words, if we preach the gospel to 100 people and 99 of them do not receive Jesus, does that mean that salvation doesn't work? Would you ever say that? You'd never say that. Why? Because Jesus died for our sins Amen. and for our lives. And we've emphasized that throughout the centuries. And only in modern times, I mean, there have been different, re modern, different revivals of healing. But if we stood the same hundred people in a line and we prayed for all 100, and 99 of them did not get healed. Many people would be much more tempted to walk away and say, well, I guess it isn't God's will to heal. Because 99 of them are not healed. I didn't see it with my own eyes. But just because we don't see salvation of the soul with our own eyes does not negate the reality that salvation is real. Healing works the same way. Because the scripture tells us, and I love this, when we look into Joel chapter 2, and Joel is prophesying about this time that will come, and I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your young men shall uh, see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And he lays out this entire prophetic word. And it's about the day of Pentecost. We know that now. And if you go into... Uh, the book of Acts chapter 2, we find that even Peter, and I love to say it this way, Jesus denying, fearful, hiding in a corner in an upper room, G uh, Peter, when the Holy Ghost came upon him and all of them in that upper room, a noise began and this noise caused the crowd to be attracted to them because everybody was in Jerusalem for Passover. They, and as these men and women came out into the streets, each one spoke in the language of the nations that happened to be present. I've been teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, not tonight, but that's another, another story. But uh, here, here's the point. When Joel concluded his prophetic word about what would happen on the day of Pentecost, he concluded it in Joel chapter 2 and verse 32 by saying, And everyone who will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if we were to go into book of Acts chapter 2, I don't know if it, I think it's verse 22. I don't have that open in front of me. But when we look at that same verse, Peter concludes in front of all of those who are present and hearing their, the gospel or whatever they're hearing in their own languages. Peter concludes not by saying, hey, you better get baptized in the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit are flowing and let's worship God. Peter concludes by saying, everyone who will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the outpouring of the Spirit and the presence of God leads us to this revelation that what? Everyone shall be saved. So now, what does that happen to do, have to do with Mark chapter 16? And believers shall lay, on the, lay hands on the sick. Well, we understand that salvation, according to several passages, and I'm not, I'm not in there, but salvation in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, and in other scriptures in the New Testament, the word saved literally is the Greek word. Everybody knows it. Sozo. And that word so-so means to be saved from eternal damnation, according to Thayer's. Saved from eternal damnation. Um, it means to be um, delivered from damnation destruction and danger it means to be made well it means to be healed it means to be made entirely whole so it has many different uh, components of that word there are many different components of that word salvation and so part and parcel in salvation is healing it took place at the same time that christ paid 
for our sins. But experience tells us, not you, of course, just me, perhaps. And I like to tell people that if you'll pray for 100 people, after you've laid hands on 100 people, laid hands on the sick 100 times, then talk to me about what the will of God is regarding healing. Because your percentages, I said this last week, your percentages are sure to go up. You pray for one, they don't get healed. Well, you're an old, you're zero, nada, nothing, nichivo, depending on the language you want to say it in. But you pray for 100, you may end up with 50% of those getting healed. And here's the other thing. You may never see them get healed. But where are you putting your faith? You may never actually see with your own eyes that they were healed. Where are we placing our expectation? Is it when we see it, we believe it? Or is it when we activate it, we understand that healing has already transpired? Now, we have to set them in the position to expect that they what? Shall recover over a period of time. And the big difference between those who receive healing often and those who don't is the fact that they don't understand this thing called time. And in the mind of the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And if you think about it, the however many years you want to live, whether it's 100 or 80 or 120 or 70, this is the shortest period of time you will spend anywhere ever in your life. Shortest period of time. You have an eternity where you will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. He has a, a millennial kingdom that will be set up that you will rule and reign. These 120 years that he limited man to in the earth in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3 is the shortest period of time that you will ever live. And most likely the least impact you may ever have. Yet, and me too, Yet, Jesus felt that it was significant that we understand that believers shall. Now, I don't know, Jill, if you can speak to the word shall in the British English, the proper English language. But according to us, you know, um, ones raised in U.S. English, we understand that shall is the, it's much, it's stronger than will. Shall is more conclusive. It's more definite. That's the word. So, shall be saved. So, the writers interpret from the Greek for us, of the, the, the interpreters of the Bible, communicate to us, shall be saved. And that's where we want to place our expectation. So, there we go. That was all intro, and I never got to a note on the page yet. That's not good. <laughs> Max, it's your fault. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Just, it's the anointing. You know, you got up there and you preached. <laughs> so let me share a couple of scriptures. I'll try not to go much longer, and you'll just have to come back the next time. But before I jump into that, let me share this. Because <clears throat> we learned this from our mentor, T.L. Osborne. Because think about this. Believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Okay. I love it. You know, we asked Dr. Tiel, Dr. Tiel, there was something that they called the healing revivals in America in the 50s, the tent revivals and the healing revivals. Dr. Tiel, what happened? You know, because everybody says, and I don't doubt that there was a great move of God. But as our mentor would also say, God moves when we move. He's, he needs a vessel. He's moving when we move, when we do something for him, when he has people to flow through and people to act through and people who are standing up for him and preaching and speaking. But we, Kevin asked Dr. Teal, Dr. Teal, what do you equate, equate the 50s healing miracle revivals with in America? <laughs> Now, see, only a man who's been at that time had been in ministry 60 years could probably say something like this. He said, well, 
there was a group of men, we all got together and we determined to solve some questions. We wanted to resolve some questions that we saw in the Bible. So there were three questions that we asked and determined to resolve. And the three questions were simply this. Is God able to heal? So we went into the scripture, we pulled it apart to see what the Bible said. Is God able to heal? And we discovered that throughout the scriptures, God most definitely is able to heal. Then the second question we wanted to resolve is, is God willing to heal? Of course, we can go to Luke chapter 5 and verse 12, the story of the leper. When the leper came to Jesus, obviously he had come to Jesus, he had fallen before him, and he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. And of course, he responded, we know, by saying, I will, or I am willing. And he literally reached out and touched the leper, and he was healed. That's really what I wanted to talk to you about tonight was the touch. Because when we begin to understand the power of the touch and the power that Jesus understood because of the touch, then we recognize the power that we release because we are believers that have the touch as we lay hands on the sick. And so that second question, they resolved that God was willing to heal. But the last question that they ask, and to them was probably very important at that moment, is God ready to heal? In other words, we might all say, God is able to heal. He's God. He can do anything he wants to do. <laughs> we might all be able to say, well, God is willing to heal because he can will whatever he wants to will. He willed the creation into existence. But the question might be, is God ready? In other words, will he act for us now? Can we be confident that when we step out on his word or when we follow the scripture, can we be confident that he is ready now to heal? And, and of course, we know from Corinthians, it says, now is, I love that passage, now is what? The day of salvation. And that is also from the Greek, the root word, that it runs through other Greek words, but that is also from the Greek word so-so. So now is the day of so-so for anyone who will call on the name of the Lord. So, how did this impact America? You know, many of these great healing evangelists that you can study about, you can read the books about, they're called generals of the faith. They ran huge tents. They started universities. They created um, CFNI. They created Oral Roberts University. They created other organizations. And they were flying under one banner called the word of, what was it called? The Voice of Healing, I think it was, magazine many years ago. These men, after spending this time together and pondering over these questions, they got up from that table and they decided that now was the time for America to receive her healing. And they got up together and they began to ri raise up tents and they began to rent halls and they began to travel the United States of America preaching this gospel with confidence that he was not only a savior, but that he was a healer and he was a deliverer. And T.L. said, Leslie, yes, God moved greatly in the nation, but it was because there was a group of people who were committed to understanding who God was and what he was willing to do in or at that time that these things broke open across the United States of America. So I submit to you tonight that if God, if Jesus, in some of his final words to us, leaves us with the words, and believers shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover, that perhaps if like those men in the 50s, who made that decision to raise up their tents and to get active about the preaching and the demonstration of the gospel, if we will do it with the simplicity of the knowledge that we have of the word of God, that we can cause dynamic change across the country. You say, Leslie, well, there's only 15 of us in this room. Why do you talk that way? Because I'm used to talking 
Max, you understand? I'm used to talking to nations and leaders of nations. Yeah, I know you know. <laughs> and leadership. But see, America says it's going to be grassroots. How will it become grassroots? We want to take Jesus at his words and do it. Amen? Can you handle a few more minutes or are you already, are you over? You're tired? You sure? Well. Brother, you are in America. <laughs> we have an agenda. We don't break our agenda. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it needs, it should, well, we are a very productive nation, and that's not a bad thing. People, people manage time, and that is not a bad thing. So I'm looking for the beginning of my notes. So I want to briefly just look at the accounts of Jesus laying hands on the sick and what it might mean to us. Because in the book of Acts, it begins by saying, uh, Luke was writing to Otheopolis. I, he's writing of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so the Gospels to us are a picture of what Jesus did and what he taught his disciples to do. And therefore, they are the instruction manual for what you and I can do. And it's a fine line because the local church is absolutely so vital in the development of families and home and care for the children and care for each other. But very often, the church lives in the epistles. And I think sometimes we want to make sure, not always, I'm not saying it's your church at all, but we want to, I believe, go back into the Gospels and we want to see the operational manual for what it means to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out devils, and bring life to communities and the multitudes. Amen? So let's look at Mark chapter 1 and verse 41. And I'll just go through these quickly. It says, And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, it said, and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 23, And they besought him, Jesus, greatly saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands or your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. In verse 27, the woman with the issue of blood pressed behind through the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I may, what? Touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And then Jesus said, who touched my clothes? In verse 31, he said, he said, Jesus again said, who touched me? So evidently something was happening through the touch of the hand. And Jesus, not only was Jesus demonstrating it, but it was being, the touch was being sought out after by the people. Well, someone might say, well, of course, he was God. He was Jesus. They didn't know that. They did not know that Jesus was God. They did not know that Jesus was even the Son of God. They thought, and I wrote the scripture out, when the Pharisees were gathered together, they ask him, what, ye, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say the son of David. And he says unto them, well, then how, how does David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord says unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. And no man, so if David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer Jesus a word. And in most of the situations, it says in Luke 24, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was, it says, a prophet mighty indeed. This is on the road to Emmaus. He's been crucified. He's died. He's risen from the dead now. They don't know where the body is. Jesus is walking down the road of Emmaus, Emmaus, uh, to Emmaus with these two gentlemen. And they say to Jesus of Nazareth, which... This man was a prophet, and you've not heard that this great prophet has been crucified, that he's died? In other words, 
even after he had died and he was entering through the resurrection, they had yet not comprehended this was God, the Son of God. It was only later that they began to understand that as it was unveiled in the Scripture. So what does that mean to us? That simply means that when the people began reaching out for Jesus, what were they reaching out for? He wasn't the Son of God. Perhaps he was a prophet, yes. We know he was a prophet with the Son of God, but they're reaching out for him. So what was happening that would cause them to reach out for him? Are you interested? Just a little bit. <laughs> well, think of this passage. Jesus, just imagine, it would be like me walking in here today and sitting down amongst you. I walk through the room with my very tiny stature, not drawing any attention to myself whatsoever as I came through the room. And I tell people the story of my roommate all the time in college. We were walking through the mall. We were in... And she started freaking out. I mean, freaking out. She's grabbing my hand. She's shaking. She's freaking out. She's, what are all these people staring at us? And I said, I thought, how do I say this to her? I said, I don't think I can say it to her. I said, go stand over there. Uh, no, I said, I'm going to go stand over there and you walk. And she walked. She looked around. I said, now you go stand over there and I'll walk. She went, oh, my God. Everybody looks at you. <laughs> But she learned. So if I was to walk through this room in my small stature and parade to the front of the room and sit down and open up my Bible and say to you, or open up the scroll of Isaiah and say to you, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. And to stay, now, when we look at that, we might think, well, he said it only one time because it's only recorded in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 one time. But don't you think it's like I went to, we were in the Ural Mountain region of Russia, and we had one of our tents up, one that we had given to one of our evangelists out there, good-sized tent. When I arrived in the town, I like stories. I hope you like stories. I think they amplify meaning, Yeah. So we arrive in the town, and of course, the Orthodox are out there, and they've got a pickup truck, which they don't have many over there, so where they got it, I don't know. And they've got a bell the size of a human in the back of it, and they're ringing the bell, and they're carrying incense, and they're um, carrying placards, and they're, you know, saying, don't, the foreign devil is here, don't go to the tent, the foreign devil is here, you know. It doesn't bother me, I've been through that so many times I've been called everything it's okay but I walk right into the tent and I have a group of Americans with me so there's a point to the story I have a group of Americans with me that I would consider friends in ministry and we're just talking away and then all of a sudden it's my I'm supposed to the music's done and I'm supposed to be up on the platform and I walk up onto the platform <laughs> and and there's not a lot of people in the tent. There's a whole lot of people outside of the tent. And boy, is it noisy. And I start to talk to the crowd. And I'm standing here and I went, wait a minute. I am entirely in the wrong mindset. I have made a mistake. I looked down at my friends on the front row and I said, none of them had been with me on a mass evangelism stage before. So I just looked at them and I said, excuse me. Uh, I've made a mistake and you're about to see the evangelist. And so I stood back up on the platform and I shouted to the city, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and He has sent me to your city to bring good news. And I just began proclaiming that. And then I said, come in here now and sit down in this tent. And I just said it with such authority. And all of a sudden, it got quiet. And the people started filtering into the tent, and they all sat down. Now, the evangelist that, and his uh, associate that took us home, you know, from that event or back to where we were staying, the whole time he's going, oh, 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 I finally seen a real evangelist. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking, well, what do you do when you preach? <laughs> 
But you see, if we're not mindful, believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why can we be confident of that? If you've been born again, you've been baptized into Christ Jesus. You've been redeemed. You've been sealed under the day of redemption. You are clothed once again as Adam was in the garden in his glory and in his spirit and by his spirit. And if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you have a conscious, even a more conscious awareness of his presence upon and his presence within. And so we think Luke 4 and verse 18, Jesus said one time as he opened up the scroll, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I dare say to you, I dare to say to you that wherever he went, in front of the masses, inside of the synagogue, on the street corner of the village that he was in, wherever he went, that he was bold to declare that according to Isaiah, the scroll, we give it a number now, but the scroll that he read, according to Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. And he had come to minister to those who were sick and had need and were ready for something in their lives. And they learned that upon his touch was something more than, than, than just the human hand of a synagogue ruler or the human hand of a Pharisee or even a Sadducee. But upon his hand and through his hand, was the power of the Spirit of God. Now, if Jesus is our example, and I'm not trying to preach to you an evangelistic message. I'm preaching Mark 16. I know I gave you an evangelistic picture because it was so obvious. I mean, I felt like such familiarity breed, it truly can breed contempt. Not that people contempt you, but you can just bring contempt to the Spirit of grace and God that is upon you. By thinking you know someone by what you see happening in their lives rather than understanding who they are by the Spirit of God. Because each one of us goes through, what, difficulties in life. Life, God never promised us a perfect life. <laughs> he promised us in the midst of life. He would certainly provide all that we needed. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I what? Shall not want. I shall not want, but I can find all that I need in him. All right, can you take a little bit more? Are you still with me? Are you sure? Just a little bit more? Okay. Oh, so Mark chapter 7 and verses 33 through 35, and it says that Jesus took the man aside who was deaf and dumb, and it says that he put his I love this. He put his fingers into his ears and he spit and he touched his tongue. I mean, how many of you would go for that if the preacher came up to you and said, I'm gonna, can I spit on my finger and put it on your tongue? We'd go, COVID, no! <laughs> I haven't had my vaccine. I don't want the flu. <laughs> you know, so he spits. Now, what we don't know, and I don't have time to teach on this, or maybe what's not obvious in the Scripture, and we may know, is that it was an Eastern custom to understand that there was healing power in, in spit. It's very true. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, his mom always went, yeah. No, no, it's true. I wish I had those notes with me, but I don't. But it is a fact that in that part of the world, they considered spittle to be... Uh, to be um, capable of bringing healing to an individual. So for Jesus to spit like that over someone was to them an expectation of healing, whereas to us it would be an expectation of, man, you got to be crazy. <laughs> you know, I want to be healed, but not that bad. <laughs> I'm teasing, teasing. And, I, you know, when you're desperate enough, you'll pretty much go after whatever you need to, you know. Amen. So it says, then this is, again, here we have touching. He put his fingers then in his ears. He touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Epaphatha, that is, be open. And straightway, immediately his ears were opened. 
and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he, sp- he spoke plainly. So you can't argue with the method. There's something in the touch. Why is the touch important? Now you think about it. We are what? Made in his likeness? I mean, this is so simple. We're made in his likeness and in his image. If he is a, the example and he can touch, how much more so are we now the example to the world and we can touch, but we don't touch independent of God. We touch with the knowledge that God lives in us. You know, I just read an article that just came out and it said they're discovering that healing for depression and other neurological diseases can come through the touch. And in particular, the study was regarding depression. So then the article went on to say that it didn't even have to be the touch of someone that you knew. It was just the touch of a fleshly hand upon your fleshly body to bring healing and comfort to a soul that is depressed. There's something in the touch. That's a touch without God. We have a touch with God who dwells in us. Amen? I could go into Habakkuk and we could talk about the horns and the, and the light that comes out of his hands and the power and go into uh, Malachi. And Malachi talks about he, we shall rise up on wings at, and we shall uh, be healed and we shall leap forth out of the stall with healing. And I like what Keith Moore says about leaping forth out of the stall. He said, we had cows when I was growing up and they nurse on their mamas and they stay in that barn until their legs are strong enough. And then when we loose them out of the stall, they go bouncing through. They start a little step here, a little step there, you know, and they get their a little step here, a little step here. And then when they bust out of that door, they go jumping all over the field because they found their freedom. This is what healing means for you and I. And this is the healing that we have in our wings. And the wings referring to, because Habakkuk talks about healing coming out of the hands and the wings and the fire and the light beams And Habakkuk is referring to the light beams coming out of the hand and driving out pestilence. Habakkuk chapter 2. And in Malachi, the healing coming out of the wings and rising up on those wings and receiving that healing. Like a calf, a newborn calf out of the stall. That's what we bring to people. That's what's in us that we bring this life and light of healing in our touch and in our hands to loose them from the stalls of depression and sickness and to loose ourselves. Amen? I don't know about you. I lay hands on myself. I do. I confess the word, but I'll just put my hands. If I, I can remember we were somewhere in the Ukraine, Crimea, Simferopol. And I jumped down off of a stair and I hit uneven ground and I felt that ankle rip right over. And I went, I just started to shout. I put my hand on my ankle and I just started, in the name of Jesus, I lay my hand on this and I command healing. And then I said, and as an act of faith, I'm going to jump. And I started jumping on my ankle. And I walked away from there and I was completely fine. But that's training yourselves to, ourselves to operate in that fashion. Plus, there was no doctor I could go to. And I had an outreach and some business I had to take care of. So I didn't have much choice. I had to be healed. <laughs> I wasn't going to be able to drag across the platform with a limp leg. You know? <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> I have fun when I preach. What about Isaiah 53 and verse 1? I love this. Who has believed our message? And? Or we could, yeah. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Couldn't we say to the one that has believed the message, the arm of the Lord is revealed? The strength of God, the touch of God. 
But it's not his strength and not just his touch. It's his strength in us and our touch upon the people. Hallelujah. All right, folks, there's a whole lot more here, but I probably ought to stop. Hallelujah. Pardon? Good stuff. <laughs> oh, just I want to close with a couple of thoughts that are here. So I'd ask you tonight, which camp are you in? Are you believing in healing or are you believing for your healing? The reason I bring this up, and I brought this up last week, is because there comes a point, there will, often there comes a point in individuals' lives where you have to deal with some type of critical issue. Perhaps a sickness in the body, perhaps something may happen. And so if we're believing in healing, we know that God can do that. But we don't have an experience of God doing it for us. So if we're believing for our healing, I call that a daily experience in the Word of God where the Word of healing becomes real in our lives so that we have that, if you will, expectation of a manifestation of healing in our lives. And it starts with, and I shared this last week, not reaching for the allergy medication because it's that time of the year. It starts with not calling 911 first, but laying hands on the individual first and then calling 911. Administering the power and the life and the healing anointing of God first and then making the reach for the telephone or whatever is required. Many years ago, when I had just uh, been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I was managing a bank in Melbourne, Florida. And then I was a commercial lender, so I had been assigned both ends of the county because, they, because I was what they called the new wave of banker, where we actually studied the numbers. We were no longer making real estate loans based on the fact that the Florida market continued to go up. They had to make legitimate loans. We had to be able to evaluate the balance sheet, the, the income statement, you know, and cash flow and all of that. And so I was working both ends of the county, and I was up in Titusville. Went out to lunch with one of the bankers there in the Titusville Bank. And we're having lunch in this cafe. And all of a sudden, I, it just seems to me that the, the atmosphere around me was glimmering kind of shimmering, maybe that's a better word to say, shimmering. And I remember, I, to this day, I remember thinking, what is, I'm like, what is, <laughs> you know, who, what is that? You know, and I'm so young in the things of the Lord, I, I don't really know that I know, you know. It's like, what is that? And then all of a sudden, on the other side of the restaurant, I heard a wabam, and people started screaming. And then I knew. I looked at the lady at the lunch table and I said, I got to pray. She looked at me. I said, I got to pray. And she said, well, pray. So, so I, I jumped up and I ran across the restaurant over to the other side. And here's a man laid out on the floor and people are all around him trying to minister to him. So I come up to the group and I'm like, I got to pray. And they're just looking at me like, who are you? What are you? I said, I got to pray. And so finally, you know, they wouldn't let me in. So it's like I took a little run. I tell people I took a little run and I did my softball slide into first base, you know, <laughs> to avoid being tagged. I slid right in the middle <laughs> and I got my hands up on his chest. And now I'm up there with my hands on his chest. It's like, now what do I do? You know, I got to pray. <laughs> so, so, so I had my hand on his chest. I put one hand up to heaven and I started to say, Oh, Lord God in heaven. And I no sooner said that and I heard these words, Rebuke the devil. And I'm like, Rebuke the devil. <laughs> so, <laughs> you've never had these experiences, right? You know, you did everything right and perfect your first time, right? So here I'm sprawled out, and I've got a business suit on, high heels, the, you know, the skirt, the whole thing, and I'm sprawled out on this man, and I rebuke the devil, and, uh, and then he coughs. <coughs> and 
and he starts to sit up. And now I'm like, oh, my God, he's sitting <laughs> up. What am I going to do now? I wish I could have told you I was like Peter or Paul, you know, in the book of Acts, you know. <laughs> Rise in the name of Jesus, you know. I just bent over and I whispered in his ear and I said, sir, I said, Jesus has healed you. I'm confident of that. You know that. They're going to take you to the hospital now. Because now the EMTs are working on an upstairs. I'm still sprawled out over his body. And the EMTs are everywhere. You know, and I'm trying to minister to this man. <laughs> and they scoop him up. And they put him in the back of the vehicle. And they take him off. And it's funny because I had to go back to the bank. You know, when I went back to the bank, everybody's like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I'm still working that into the county. I hope these stories bless you. It's good for me to rem remember them. Well, what are we talking about? Believers shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. Are you available? Kevin and I were on vacation in Cabo San Lucas. And we're, we're walking through the pool. You know, the, the, uh, or he left. I went to the room first. He was maybe settling the bill or something. And he's walking by the pool. And all of a sudden, he hears this woman screaming. <laughs> and, and he says, ma'am, what's wrong? What's wrong? My husband, my husband, my husband, he's had a heart attack and he's laid out on the deck. So Kevin bends over and he says, I rebuke you, devil. I say, be healed in the name of Jesus. And Kevin walked onto the room. Because <laughs> had she had it handled with whomever needed to handle it. So, <laughs> but it's that simple, folks. What's, what's the difference? TL, we used to sit with Dr. T.L. Osborne and say this. The only difference between us and the majority of the people who are standing out on that field tonight is experience. We have enough faith for them because we've seen so much to invite them into the arena of God's love and atmosphere of his healing heart. And so, anyway, the next day in Cabo San Lucas, and I know I left you in Titusville, but the next day in Cabo San Lucas, um, Kevin sits down to breakfast and actually, I'm there too. And he starts talking to me. And this lady says, that's the voice. That's the voice. Honey, honey, that's the voice. And they both turn around and her husband was joining her at breakfast. He had been healed from that one laying on of the hands over his body. And he was there having breakfast with his wife. So I'd work, I, so now, I'm taking you back to I'm barely spirit-filled, don't know I have a call of God on my life, haven't traveled the nations, I got nothing going on except I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. And so I have to go to the north end of the county again, and like, that bank was right close to that cafe it's like I couldn't get into the bank without them seeing me over there at that cafe you know so one day I'm trying to walk through there and this man's yelling across the street hey is it you is it you I've later learned from all of our mass meetings that when you hear that phrase there's a miracle on the other end of it <laughs> but he's yelling is it you is it you? Hey, stop. He's like, will you stop? I'm like, I don't want to go. <laughs> they already think I'm really weird. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and so I stopped. And he came across the street and he said, I'm the owner of the restaurant. You're the woman that prayed. And that was my father. He'd had a quadruple bypass. They took him to the hospital. There was not one sign of a bypass on his heart. He had a brand new heart. And the doctors couldn't explain it. You hearing me? Believers. I wasn't even a really strong believing believer. I was just, I got to, willing, willing. I got to pray. And he had to instruct me in the moment. Rebuke the devil. You see, most of us, when we want to lay hands on the sick, we want to invoke God's spirit for him to do something. And the reality is God never told us that we were to pray for the sick. He said we were to what? Heal 
the sick. You'll find that in Mark chapter 10. Um, you find it in, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels. He didn't tell us to pray for the sick. He told us to heal the sick. Well, believers shall lay hands on the sick. He didn't say believers shall pray for the sick and they shall recover. Believers shall what? Touch. Put the touch on them. Put the touch on them. Put the touch on your employees. Of course, in the right places so you don't get accused of anything. It is America. <laughs> of course, you don't want litigation. <laughs> but put the touch on them. Put the touch on your children frequently. Put the touch on your grandchildren, grandchild. Put the touch on the daughter that comes, the mother of the grandchild. She may not have any idea, but you can put the touch all over her. <laughs> Amen? That's what makes us different. We have the touch. And I've got much more in here, but I think that's a good place to stop for the night. Can you say this with me? Say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And, say, and we'll say this, Lord Jesus, I don't care if the first 50 I lay hands on don't look any different. <laughs> That doesn't change the covenant of healing. Amen. You heal the sick through me. Amen? Amen. 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 God is good.